Hello, I'm Aaron Lohr, and this is the Endocrine News Podcast. Today, we're talking about what's new in obesity treatment, and joining me on the podcast is Dr. Donna Ryan, Professor Emerita at Pennington Biomedical in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Dr. Ryan is Associate Editor-in-Chief of the journal Obesity. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Ryan. Thank you for having me, Aaron. So I wanted to start off by just quoting some stats I got from the CDC earlier, Mm -hmm. because they're kind of startling. So according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, obesity affects about 93.3 million adults in the United States. That's nearly 40% of the adult population. So what do you think is fueling this epidemic? It is an epidemic, especially if you consider that the rates of obesity in the United States were 17% up until the 1980s. My goodness. So a really rather recent phenomenon. So the general way we think about what's causing this is that there is genetic susceptibility and environmental exposure, so an obesogenic environment. The conventional wisdom would be that what's going on is a food environment where there's ready access to highly palatable, affordable, and delicious food and all the time. And at the same time, we have a work environment and a play environment that doesn't really require a lot of physical activity. So there have been drastic changes in both the food supply and the the amount of energy that's required for most people to complete their work or even to amuse themselves. But it's important to recognize that their obesity is a complex chronic disease and there are multiple factors that drive risk for obesity, not just the food and physical activity environment. So we, we know that lack of sleep, stress, endocrine disruptors, uh, many other factors can drive risk for obesity. And we know that individuals who have lower socioeconomic status and and lower educational attainment are also at greater risk uh, for obesity. So it's a complex etiology. Yeah, it's it's kind of scary the way that you frame it because I think about, you know, myself personally, Mm -hmm. as I imagine a lot of our listeners are thinking about themselves, is that we're not always set up very well to be successful in this area. You know, for someone like who works in an office, you sit all day. And when it's time for lunch, whatever food you want is basically right outside your doors <laughs> and it's back to more sitting yeah. time. Um, and so I can see why the obesity number might be as high as it is, even yeah. though it's such a startling number. It's also amazing. There's this secular trend of weight gain that's going on. Mm. So if you follow individuals from age 18 over 20 years, 95% of them will gain at least one BMI unit. So over that period of time, both men and women are gaining weight, and only 5% of young adults are actually maintaining their weight. So there's this environmental pressure that drives weight gain. And another important thing is that our body is biologically designed to defend its highest fat mass. (laughs) Yeah, so we call this the set point or the settling point, and... Whatever our highest body weight is, our highest body fat is, there's a lot of physiology that defends this. And leptin, a signal of of the quantity of body fat that we have, when leptin falls, it sets in motion a number of biologic and physiologic adaptations that were designed to prevent starvation, but which actually cause that highest fat mass to be vigorously defended. Oh, no. <laughs> That's why it's so hard to lose weight. Oh, no. Yeah. That's not what I wanted yeah. to hear. Sorry. That's all right. It's what it is. Yeah. Um, so when we think about the obesity epidemic and, and how big it is now, it seems that we have a little bit of a, of a war on our hands. How do we combat this? So when we think about the different treatments that are available. What works? So what we know that works is to create lifestyle changes mm-hmm. around food and physical activity. We know this from these large studies, the Diabetes Prevention Program, where we achieved about 6% weight loss and had a dramatic benefit in improving risk for diabetes. And, you know, there was a 58% reduction in conversion rates from impaired glucose tolerance to type 2 diabetes. And from the look-ahead study in patients with 
type 2 diabetes, we achieve 9% weight loss with a lifestyle intervention. So with lots of health benefits. So what's going on is our professional societies and the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force and all these government policymakers recognize that if we can change lifestyle, we can really improve health. And so they're really promoting behavioral counseling by our physicians The problem is it's very difficult to replicate what we did in those big studies in academic centers. It's difficult to replicate that Mm -hmm. in the real world. One thing I often hear about with behavioral change is that sometimes adherence, like sticking with it, can be a real challenge. Have you found that to be true? Yeah, adherence is the best predictor of weight loss and long-term weight loss success. But adherence is multidimensional. So we know that people who attend the most behavioral sessions lose the most weight, that people who keep the best food diaries lose the most weight, the people who use the most meal replacements lose the most weight. So you can adhere in multiple uh, dimensions, but it's really all about behaviors around food intake and physical activity over the long term. What we're trying to do in these things is really create an environment that supports a healthier, settled body weight. Yeah. I like that. If you want to get involved in something, you know, that's maybe a good behavioral change plan for you. Yeah. It's all that the advice is go and get involved and, and be as involved as you can. <laughs> you yeah. really give to it. Now, a lot of folks don't oftentimes have the patience for what some of these programs might call for, and they explore trendy, fad, yeah. sort of crash diet kind of things. Are any of these trendy diets actually helpful and can they be dangerous? You know, Erin, I think every physician today is being bombarded with questions about the ketogenic diet Mm. or intermittent fasting or time-restricted feeding. These are the big current dietary fads. For healthy people, healthy overweight and people with obesity who are healthy, what the way I think about these is that they're strategies for navigating a very difficult obesogenic food environment. So the way they work is you're really restricting food choices uh, in the case of the low-carb or ketogenic diets. So, And the fewer food choices you have, the fewer calories you eat. In the case of the intermittent fasting approaches, you're only allowed to eat during certain hours yeah. or every other day. And so if you restrict your ability to eat food continuously, you will also eat fewer calories. So I don't think there's anything magic about these diets. And as long as patients don't have type 2 diabetes or eating disorders or are pregnant and lactating or are taking certain drugs like uh, SGLT2 inhibitors, they, they can be safe. And I usually am very permissive with patients about this. If you want to use one of these approaches to try to lose weight, well, that's fine. I'll support you. But, you know, we need to get together after you've been on this um, because they can be very difficult eating patterns to sustain. And so if people want to use this as a technique to lose weight, I'm usually okay about it, but I'm really trying to get people to a healthier food environment that really supports long-term weight loss maintenance. You know, we know that a Mediterranean diet approach is associated with reduction in cardiovascular events. That's the only diet that's been proven in a randomized clinical trial to actually reduce heart disease, Mm. you know, or strokes. So, hey, we need to get people onto a diet that has more plants in it, more fruits and vegetables, that has fewer sugars, that has more monounsaturated fats and fewer saturated fats and hydrogenated oils. We need to avoid those things. We need nuts in our diet. You know, so we need this healthier eating pattern. And we know that a a wide variety of foods is also health promoting. Hmm. So we want to take advantage of that over the long term. But in terms of the fad diet approach, the problem is sustaining those approaches over the long term. They're really almost impossible to sustain because they so restrict uh, your ability to eat a wide variety of foods. I hear you, and I've been there. <laughs> there years ago in the Atkins diet. Yeah, I did that too. Yeah, <laughs> couldn't keep it up forever. No, Eventually, you're gonna no. you're gonna crash. You're gonna break it. Yeah. I guess that's what I did. So, anyways. 
Um, at what point might a physician and patient come to a conclusion that diet and exercise may not be enough? And then what other options are available? I think it's really important that uh, patients recognize the strong biology that's behind their struggle and that physicians discuss that with them and let them know that their struggle is not their fault. Mm. It's really not a matter of weak willpower so much as it is a matter of very strong biology mm. that we're up against. So I think the very first step is to tell patients they shouldn't blame themselves. This is mother nature at work. And sometimes Mother Nature needs help. We need to fight biology with biology. So if patients have a history of struggling with their weight, of either not being able to lose enough or losing but regaining, I'll offer medications because medications work through biology, mostly through appetite, to help patients better adhere to their dietary intention. You know, and we know if you have fewer problems with appetite, you're more likely to stick to your dietary intentions. So to me, I think we don't use medications enough. We really need to call on these more often. Our very conservative FDA has approved four medications for long-term use, and we have one medication that's been around since the 50s that we think can be used safely. So there's no reason not to embrace these medications. To me, one of the big advantages of the medications is not that they're powerful in producing a lot of weight loss. On average, they only produce about 5% or more greater weight loss than you get with lifestyle alone. But their big advantage is they really help sustain that hard-won weight loss. So every one of my patients has said to me, you know, it's not the problem of losing weight. It's the problem of keeping it off yes. that I struggle with. Mm -hmm. So so it seems like in today's culture where people would love to have a pill for almost anything, to yeah. not be taking advantage of pharmacological options for obese treatment, that does seem weird. Do you have an opinion as to why it is that it's not taken more advantage of? Yeah, I think we have a long history of thinking it was poor willpower. We thought that, you know, we could just reduce the patients and end a problem. Mm. You know, I think our understanding of the biology of obesity is what really makes that different. Um, so it's foundational to good weight management is understanding the causes of the struggle. I think patients typically have not gone to physicians for help with weight loss. They feel completely responsible for their own weight management. And it's important for physicians to raise the topic with them sensitively mm -hmm. and to let the patient know that there are options that they can help the patient with in the weight loss struggle. The whole idea here is to think about weight as a driver of the chronic diseases and to think about weight in the context of health. It's not really a judgment about somebody's body size. It's really about trying to let weight loss be the pathway to better chronic disease management. So what are the pharmacological options that mm -hmm. seem to be the most efficient? Mm -hmm. One medication is Arlistat. That has no effect on appetite, but it really it enforces a low-fat dietary approach because it's a it blocks the absorption of fat. And if patients take this medication before a meal that's high in fat or a high-fat snack, they'll have steatorrhea. So it's, it's a way of really enforcing a low-fat dietary approach. It blocks the absorption of about 30% fat in the diet. Our other medications affect appetite. So we have an old-timey kind of medication, Phentermine, it's a noradrenergic agent. It can be safely used as long as physicians don't use it in patients who have pre-existing cardiovascular disease because it, it can increase blood pressure and pulse. It's sympathomimetic. But as long as physicians stay within a low dose and follow patients and use it in the right patients, it can be effective in helping produce and sustain weight loss. And its big advantage is it's been around since the 50s, it's generic, and it's inexpensive. It that? only costs about $20 <laughs> a month. Our other newer medications are Lorcaserin, 
a combination of fentramine and topiramate, a combination of naltrexone and bupropion, and then the first of our sort of uh, new era of obesity medications, the GLP-1 receptor agonist, loraglutide. So these medications all, on average, produce approximately 5% greater weight loss than you'd achieve with placebo alone. There's no one medication that works in every patient. So Mm. prescribers have to know about all of them. Because sometimes you'll write one, the patients will not respond, you'll have to try another one. So where we stand now is really the first generation of obesity medications approved by our very conservative FDA. What's happening in the field, what's new in obesity, is the development of new medications, and all based on this better understanding of the biology. So these newer medications are are really about taking our understanding of physiology and turning it into pharmacology. Mm -hmm. So the next generation includes semaglutide, a much stronger GLP-1 receptor agonist, a combination of uh, GLP-1 and GIP, a single molecule dual agonist. That's terzepatide. That'll probably be the second one coming along. And then other molecules that, that are combinations of GLP-1, GIP, and glucagon, or even all three. And so these molecules are going to produce more weight loss than we can currently achieve, approximately twice as much. Mm -hmm. So we're very excited about this second generation coming along. And then there are other very interesting compounds that are are in development. So I, I think the future for weight management is rosy. In about three to five years, we'll be able to produce twice as much weight loss as we can achieve now. The next 10 years, we're going to see even more. Mm -hmm. And I think eventually, within 20 years, we'll be able to achieve with medications the amount of weight loss we can currently get only with bariatric surgical procedures. So you say that second generation, is are we going to see some of those you said in the three to five year window? Yes. So there's semaglutide, which is in phase three now, terzepatide, which is going into phase three later this year. And these are much more powerful medications that are based on our understanding of the glucagon superfamily. So the glucagon superfamily includes GLP-1, GIP, and glucagon. And so by hitting more than one of these receptors in a pharmacologic way, not just a physiologic way, we're seeing a lot of benefits, not just in weight loss, but also in terms of better glycemic control. And also, if we can, that glucagon uh, mechanism we think will increase energy expenditure. That's the first. Mm. The first time we'll be able to do that. So here's a crazy question. If yeah. all these advances are coming down the line in the future, is there still a place for bariatric surgery in, in the future, or is everything moving more into the pharmacotherapy side? You know, our bariatric surgery is currently the only way we know how to produce enough weight loss to really produce health benefits in several areas. First, we know that it it can prevent cardiovascular events. We know that it can reverse non-alcoholic steatotic hepatitis. We know that it can have a dramatic benefit in terms of obstructive sleep apnea. Currently, we can't do that with medical approaches. Mm -hmm. So we need that bariatric surgery for patients who have severe complications of obesity. It can be life-saving in those patients. Well, this has been an absolutely fascinating conversation. Thank I you. want to have you on in a few years here so we can see yeah. you know, how things have progressed and, and yeah. talk through what this future is really holding. Thank you so much for joining us. Aaron, thank you for having me. I enjoyed it. That's all for this episode. Thank you for listening to the Endocrine News Podcast. If you'd like to hear more of these, check us out on endocrine.org slash podcast or Apple, Google, or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you're enjoying these, please let us know by leaving a review on Apple. And if you'd like to get in touch with us, send us an email at podcast at endocrine.org. Thanks again. Endocrine News Podcasts are a free service of the Endocrine Society. To learn more or to become a member, visit the Society's website at www.endocrine.org.